the cross of Christ one day I came where springs of living water did abound. Oh, and I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills. And blessing mark the path I've trod I'm shouting hallelujah every day Well, I'm drinking at the springs of living water Oh, happy now am I My soul they satisfy I'm drinking at the springs of living water Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply Sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Well, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. I'm drinking at the springs of living water Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply Let's sing that again Well, I'm drinking at the water Oh, happy now am I My soul they satisfy I'm drinking at the springs of living water and bountiful supply. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Glory to God. I am grateful today for the goodness of the Lord. Grateful for His blessings and His benefits. And uh, I was thinking, uh, I've been in Arizona preaching the last few days and coming home on the plane yesterday, my mind was already moving toward the service here. And I was thanking God for good church, great church family, people that love and care. And, and then I just stopped for a minute. And I, I know it's kind of different for me because it's not just my pastor, he's my son. But I just started thanking God for a pastor that still believes the apostolic message, still believes in the apostolic identity. hasn't backed up on the apostolic identity or the apostolic truth. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for that. Because uh, I told somebody the other day, they, this is not something I believe. This is what I am. Hello? Amen. And I'm grateful to be a part of a congregation still that, that believes this apostolic message. We're going to sing, He Took My Sins Away. Great great song but it's also a great thought you know when you come to God I'm glad he forgives aren't you all of us we I mean we're not going to air it all in public but all of us have got things we are really glad God was able to forgive but the neat thing he doesn't just forgive sins when I went down in the water of course it wasn't that it was an old muddy irrigation ditch that I got took me a week to get the dirt washed out of my hair but when I came up out of that water, he hadn't just forgiven my sins. He took them away. Like one of, one of the old grandmas in the church when I was growing up said, I'm glad that not only he forgave my sins, he took them and cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. And before he walked away, he put up a no fishing sign. And so I'm glad. Aren't you glad he took your sins away? Okay, then I want you to smile as you sing, and I want you to sing it like you really are glad he took your sins away. Now, I know some of you were moving your mouths on that last song but I want you to sing on this one, okay? I came to Jesus, weary, sword and sad. He took my sins away, he took my sins away. And love has made my heart so glad. He took my sins away. Sins away, he took my 
sins away and keeps me singing every day. Well, I'm so glad he took my sins away. He took my sins away. The load of sin, it was more than I could bear. But he took my sins away. He took my sins away. And now on him, I roll my every care. He took my sins away. Well, he took my sins away. He took my sins away. And keeps me singing every day. Well, I'm so glad he took my sins away. He took my sins away. You know, I had a unique experience this week. I was uh, preaching. It's called Arizona on Fire. It's their, they don't have a camp meeting anymore. They have a district convention. And uh, Friday night, the Lord helped me. In fact, he helped me every service, and I'm glad of that. But uh, it, was a, it was a message applicable to everybody, but I just really felt the move of the Holy Ghost. And I stood in front of a, a one row of pews, about 200 young people, and I preached for about 30 minutes to them and felt the Lord directing it. And after that, the altar service, it's, it's been a long time since I've seen. There was probably 200 plus young people right at the front of the altar, every one of them speaking in tongues and tears dripping off their chin. And for those who are naysayers and gloom and doomers about the church, I'm going to tell you what, God's going to have a church. Amen. I said he's going to have a church. There's, you know, we got some young people in our church. They want to live for God. They want to serve God. They understand the power of the cross. So we that are here today and our young people mostly are out of here, uh, we need to get ready because when church starts this, this morning, we need to lead our young people into worship. Amen. So take a deep breath. Let's sing. No condemnation have I in my heart for he took my sins away. He took my sins away, his perfect peace he did to me impart. Well, he took my sins away. Well, he took my sins away, he took my sins away, and keeps me singing every day. Well, I'm so glad he took my sins away. Well, he took my sins away and if you will come to Jesus Christ today he will take your sins away he'll take your sins away and keep you happy in his love each day he will take your sins away well he took my sins away he took my sins away and keeps me singing every day. Well, I'm so glad he took my sins away. Well, he took my sins away. Let's sing it one more time. Well, he took my sins away. He took my sins away and keeps me singing every day. Well, I'm so glad he took my sins away. He took my sins away. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm so glad, Brother Franklin, that he took my sins away. Amen. Somebody told me one time, said, what sins you have? You were raised in this. You know, when I came down the altar to repent, I came just like any other sinner that ever came to God. I was lost and I needed saving. Hello? Uh, that's why people say, well, what, what they're doing isn't all that bad. Well, I don't know if it's all that bad, but if it's sin, I mean, where are they going to go? Hell number one or hell number two or hell number three? Or... Hello? I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad he took my sins away. Amen, amen. We're going to wait on you for your offering this morning, give you a chance to worship the Lord in giving in our Sunday uh, Bible hour offering and then Brother Franklin is going to come and bring the word of the Lord and we're going to help him preach I said we're going to help him preach Amen 
and we're going to have some church. All right, let's come and worship the Lord. going to steal my joy they're not going to steal my peace they're not going to steal the love of God from my heart I'm just going to keep on keeping on amen amen praise God it's good to be here this morning good to have each one of you here with us at Bible hour going to spend a few minutes talking about something I think I believe uh, will help somebody um, any anyone that um, any one of us ministers that has an opportunity to stand here um, we the, the word that we bring it it may just touch one it may touch many but um, it's just our job to deliver the message and um, so I hope this morning that what God has put on my heart um, might do something to help you in your tabernacling around in this body on this earth today so with that if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices um, turn to the book of John chapter 5 we want to welcome also those that are watching online this morning thank you for uh, chiming in and clicking here and clicking there and getting us uh, on the internet Please worship along with us. So if you're there, John chapter 5, verse uh, 2 is where we'll begin at uh, this morning. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he or she had and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made 
hole. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. It's probably uh, one of the stories you've learned in Sunday school if you've been around long enough. Um, but I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning on this subject. There is another way. There is another way. We know that there's one way to God. That's not what I'm talking about this morning, but there is another way. If you're struggling this morning, if you're trying to understand what you're going through, um, just hang on a little bit. You're going to find out this morning there's, there's another way than what you're going right now. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Kaya. Appreciate that. I have, um, I have on my body a lot of scars in life. I guess it wouldn't be politically correct to say it, but I'll say it, but boys will be boys. We jump off roofs. We grab the eight-inch circular saw and see what it'll cut. <laughs> we uh, challenge our friends and buddies, I can do that better than you. <laughs> Just silly things. I've got about a two-inch scar on my head slipping out of the bathtub while singing a great glorious song about going to heaven. I almost went to heaven that day. <laughs> I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six scars from surgeries in my life. Anywhere from a quarter inch to about inch and a half long um, got one on my thumb from when I was about five years old thought I could throw a coke bottle bottom farther than my brother but I was holding on to the sharp end when I let go of it and uh, there's just just uh, my left shoulder um, food has always been my thing you know you always hear me talk about it I grabbed a <laughs> I grabbed a pot of beans one time when I was about four I think three or four I don't remember mom three or four she makes a great pot of beans and I just wanted to smell them <laughs> so I got the right chair up beside the stove and grabbed the pot didn't realize it'd be that hot and pulled the whole thing over on me boiling and I had big scars on my shoulder from that burn and you know, these the, the scars are on the outside. There's also scars on the inside. There are a lot of things in my life that have hurt me. There are scars that will come back once in a while at the worst possible time in my emotions. When that person said what they said to me and, and they come up to shake my hand and smile and have not yet apologized and that little scar pops up because... I've been able to put it under the blood, but I don't know why for the chart. It just pops right up into my brain. And those scars, they're, I mean, they're there. They're, they're inside and outside. They're there. But, you know, there, there's, you know, to just kind of wrap this piece up right here, I, I, I will tell you this morning that I have spent the entirety of my life in church serving God one way or another the highs and the lows the ups and the downs and um, I will tell you that there were days I wondered and days I thought man this is going to be another scar this is going to be another problem another issue but let, let me say it this morning as I began to preach the few minutes of the message I have um, Regardless of what that was, and no matter how difficult the pain was externally or internally, I will tell you, and to those that are online, as David said, all that just seemed to bother me. All that seemed to get in the way, and I began to look around and wonder, you know, <laughs> man, this is getting difficult. And, and, and until I came into the house of God. I began to ask myself, why? How come? What is this all about? 
And just as sure as I'm standing here this morning, and just as sure as I walked through those double doors, and I saw that greeter just smile and shake my hand, I began to realize again after another journey and another, another scar on my heart and on my mind or in my body, this is what it's all about right here. When I came into the house of God, I began to realize this is life. And with that life will come more scars and more heartaches and more issues and more problems. But the one thing I can be assured of is that my God never changes. Never one time has my God hurt me. Has he caused me scars? It's been me. When I get into the house of God and I begin to worship and praise and sing and, and get my mind where it needs to be, that's what I'm trying to do right now, get your mind where it needs to be. Because you're living in a life that we, we, we just can't control everything. And you walk through the doors with a lot of scars on the outside and on the inside. And, and, and when you walk through those same doors I walk through, some of you probably wondered, man, I'm tired. I, I'm exhausted. I've got a lot going on. I will tell you that the response you normally make is, well, I'm just going to trudge through. I submit to you, there's another way for you to be happy. There's, there's an opportunity you have to change the direction emotionally that you're going this morning. And I want to talk to you about this other way. When, when, when Jesus saw this impotent man, and he was laying there at this, at this pool, and uh, there, there was just a lot going on, I, I, the, the, the question he asked him, I, I, I like how he did this. He just said, yeah, I, and can, can I say it simple? I mean, it's, it's simple. Wilt thou be made whole? Do, do you want to feel better? Do you want to be better? That's just the question. And look at his response. It wasn't yes. It wasn't what you got. It wasn't, yeah, talk to me. It was, yeah, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. His response, well, I'd like to, but no one's going to help me. I, I'll tell you, change is difficult, folks. Change is necessary, though. I've spent the last uh, probably 20 years of my life um, learning about change in this secular world. The last 20 years of my life trying to teach people about the importance of change. Read the book, The Heart of Change. It's difficult to change. It, it's, you, you look at where you're at and you think, they, they need to change, not me. Or that process needs to change, not me. Or the preaching needs to change, not me. And, and, and if you're not careful, you, you, you put yourself in the position that this impotent man, whatever was going on in his life, it's, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, but they're not helping me. They're not doing something for me. I have a, um, I, I don't know him at all. My mother knows him better. But I have a cousin that her husband, a practicing physician. Some years ago, four or five, six years ago, he, uh, as a physician, you know, kept track of his own self and uh, found out he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Probably around 58, 59. I'm, I'm guessing all this, so don't quote the dates, but it just popped into my head to, talk about it but um so he's diagnosed with alzheimer's and as a doctor it'd be important he doesn't continue his practice right so he decides to retire from his practice and he meets with a lot of his friends and some people he's going through some unique testing and things going on for alzheimer's in america he's in some program with his uh, physician connections and um, probably the most significant thing was they told him, you're going to have to change your diet. We think this can help you. And there's other things, but change your diet. I don't know about you, but I've probably been told that thousands of times in my life. Has anybody else been told that? Change you? Y'all giggling now. You know, I just noticed I'm so arbitrary sometimes. The reason I'm having a problem seeing you, I just 
in my notes here. Is, I fried bacon this morning. There's bacon grease all over my glasses, Sister Franklin. I just realized that. I, I thought I put the wrong glasses on. <laughs> I have close and far than I have the other ones. And I'm going, what in the world? There is bacon grease. I'd like to lick that off right now. <laughs> I'll wait till the break and clean it. <laughs> change. Change. Stop your bacon. Who can do that? <laughs> stop, stop your you know, what you're putting into your body. To, you know, so he changed his diet. He, he changed his diet. And that's been five, six, I don't know, seven years ago. You would never know he has any issue. Never. You'd never know that. Now he is going through some other things. But the, the, the change of his diet, you know, that's hard. Now, you know, I'm trying to change my diet. I'm trying. But change, in order to make change, you need some kind of motivation. And so we also call that a significant emotional event. So if you have in your life, <clears throat> excuse me, a significant emotional event in your life, there's a good chance that you will probably make a change. If the doctor gave you that kind of response or that kind of um, uh, detail of the test or whatever is going on in your life, th that would be the motivation or the significant emotional event to change you. There's... There's a, uh, it's called a process model, and it's, it's something I think I might have taught at the, at the church leadership meeting a year ago, but it's called DCOM. It's, it's a Chevron thing. I was looking for Gavin. He would know exactly what it is. You know what it is. You've been taught it, and you probably teach it yourself. Um, but it's, it's an acronym, DCOM. It's, the, the D is for direction. In order to change, you first need some direction. Well, God's word this morning is, is giving you some direction. God's word is going to talk about that there, there's another way for you to change the direction of your life. So the first thing is there's some direction going to come. You, I can't just tell you to change unless I give you some kind of direction to do that. The, the next step of that is competency. In other words, have you been trained? Have you been educated? Do you have the knowledge? Do you have the skills? Do you have the ability to make this kind of change we're going to talk about? Well, that you know... God chose the foolishness of preaching to give you the competency to make a change. We know Acts 2, 38. We know, uh, hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, one God, above all, through all, and in you all. We, okay, so the word of God and the preaching, all this, one thing have I desired, not what I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord. All these things. So I'm looking at a people, I can't see online, but a people, for the most part, that have... A competency. You've been taught. You, you've had the word of God delivered to you many, multiple times. And if you're new here this morning, we'll do that in a minute. So now you have that, that direction. You have the competency. We want to make change. But the, the next thing is the, oh, you need the opportunity to change. Now, I can tell you change, but if I don't give you the opportunity to make that change... You're going to say, well, I'm, how can I do it if you don't give me the chance to do this? So one example, I could talk for the next four hours. and You're wondering, okay, you keep talking about this, but when am I going to have the chance to change my life? So at some point, I need to turn it over to you. And, and after you have that direction and the training and the word of God and, and so on, you need the opportunity to make a decision for yourself. I can't do that for you. The last thing is the most critical and it is the motivation. You need to be motivated to change. So oftentimes when I would use this uh, at my employment, most of the time is, I need you to do this and this. Well, I don't like to. Oh, that's fine. But I'm going to motivate you. If you don't do it by next Tuesday, you won't be working here. <laughs> that's motivation, isn't it? It works every time. Here's a self-resignation form. It works great. I'll go call HR. No, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. Never mind. I'll do it. I love it. I love to do these things. <laughs> That'll motivate you. And so for all of us this morning, you, you can look at your life right now and see the direction you're going. It doesn't mean that you're going uh, astray or that you're doing anything significantly improper or whatever, but you know yourself. When you look at these scars I talk about, and 
When you look at what's going on internally, that, that's the only thing you can control is the internal part of you. When, when you look at all that going on now, you, you know, you know yourself, there's something you need to change, right? Amen? There's something, because again, I don't know about my fellow brethren that preach, but I preach this to myself. I, I need this. So, so when, it's, when it's time to make a change, regardless of what aspect of your life, you need the motivation to make that change. And so Jesus asked the man, Wilt thou be made whole? Do, do you want to feel better? Do you want to be better? And he said, oh, well, I, I can't. No one's going to help me do that. Well, we need a significant emotional event to make that change. The impotent man... We don't know that he was always there at the pool. Uh, there's no verbiage there that he was there for the 38 years. It, he could have been. I'm not that intelligent to answer that. But we don't know he was there every day. But we do know that he made his way down there. And for whatever reason, the one time a year that this was supposed to, supposed to take place, um, he, he, he made his way down there because he wanted to change. So he probably did have the direction to get to Bethesda. He probably did know how to get himself to Bethesda. And he probably did have the opportunity to get there. The, the one thing was his motivation. Um, we're not sure um, how long he had been there um, or the season, uh, spring, autumn, once a year, twice a year, that the water would be moved or stirred up. Or, but what we do know is that he had some kind of need. What we do know is he wanted to change the current situation to something different. We also know he made an effort of some kind to get there. He did show a sense of frustration. He did show in his response to Jesus that, you know, every time it happens, I try. I try to get over there. Every time this takes place and the water is troubled, I try to get over there. Can you imagine I have attention problems. I always have had that. I can't focus very well. Ask Brother Jim when he sees me driving. It scares him to death. I know it does. I just, you know, squirrel. And, and, and so does a steering wheel. I'm, very, I'm a very poor driver. I don't pay attention very well. I can see myself at the pool waiting for the water to move. That'll last for me about 15 seconds. So obviously... Whatever happened, he, he, he was very frustrated. Every time the water moved, no one was there to carry him in. You would think you'd just hang on the edge of the pool, right? You get ready to jump in the pool, and you, you, you kind of stand there and got your toes hanging over. Okay? You probably couldn't do that. But I'd have my side hanging over. I'd have my arm about an inch from the water. Well, that would last me about 15 seconds. We don't know when it was going to be troubled. We, we have no idea how long you'd have to wait for that. You know, everybody else that could just, you know, make a dive could, could get to that. The pool, the rumor was that the pool could heal you. There had to also be much disappointment there since only one person. What an attitude that people could have around the pool because only one's going to get healed. And everybody's on just waiting and, and just couldn't wait for the opportunity. Have you ever been to these, um, oh, what do they call them, mineral mineral hot springs or pools or baths or whatever they call it. Whenever I worked over on the coast, there's a place called the Paso Robles Inn. And um, it, 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 they built it in the late 1800s, and it was built around these mineral pools where this mineral water boils up out of the ground. You, you'll smell it. It's sulfur. And um, so through the years, they kind of built the inn up around those pools, and their big thing is come to the end, it's a nice place, but come to the end and our jacuzzis have the mineral water piped into them and it gives you this healing power. Still there today. I've used them a lot, hoping it would give me more smarts and it's never worked yet. I've tried it many times. But you know, you sit in that mineral water, it just stinks. Just, you know, it's sulfur. It's, but you try anything, don't you? <laughs> Might help my arthritis. My bad ankle from when I played basketball as a youth leader and was dumb enough to play with all these young people and broke my ankle 
when I knew they were eating me alive. So I, I still try and soak that in some mineral water. What, you know, you, 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 you try. Here, here's the problem. Uh, as a child of God, if I'm not careful, I will continue uh, going my insane direction because I just, I just keep trying the same thing. And expecting a different result. It's insane. When I didn't know Jesus in a life-giving measure. I can see that through the bacon grease though. I can't see that one. When I didn't know Jesus in a life-giving measure. Um, there's a lot of things I tried, Brother Jody. To be happy. To have peace. To, to just wake up in the morning and think this is going to be fun. There's a lot of things I tried. But I realized one day that everything I tried just seemed like the same thing. And I kept getting the same results. Unhappiness. Not, not wanting to wake up in the morning. Not wanting to go to work. Not wanting to walk in the doors of the church. Not just, you know, does any of this sound familiar? The, the, the best job was out there and I got there after the other guy that just got hired. That ever happened to you? Man, I went to get the perfect car for the perfect price because I only got this much money and I got there 15 minutes after they sold it. I almost won the mega jackpot. One number off. <laughs> All these things that we, we strive and try to do and we just miss it by this much and just me and, and and before I knew Jesus, I just just I almost had happiness. I almost had joy. I almost had fun going on in my life. And just it, it just I just missed it every time until until I heard a preacher one day. And, and until until I found out there's another way. There's another way out there. And my way wasn't working quite that good. So so it if you've got a scar or internally or externally in your life or in your body that, that has caused you to hold back and say, I remember when I got hurt on this or I remember when this was going on. Can I submit to you again that I have those two and, and I, I let those kind of block my vision of where I needed to try something new, that, that other way. And, and finally I was able to come into the house of worship and come in and be involved in the praise and, and, and the, the, the enjoyment of just seeing people smile. You're right. But the smile means something. When you walk through those doors, you see people that love you and want to help you inside this place. And, and, and when I walk into the house of God and I saw this, I realized this is that other thing I've been looking for. This is that one thing I've never tried. It's just the other way. It's the new thing. It's, it's, I don't know what this is, is about. And it began with being motivated. I just got tired of it all. The direction I was going wasn't helping. And the motivation was when the preacher spoke, I truly understood. And I firmly, yes, that's me too. This is who I am. I firmly understand I want to hear Jesus say, well done. I do want to go to a place that is not going to be painful for eternity. I do want to go to a place where I see him for eternity. I do want to know something that is better than just this life here alone. And, and, and when, when you begin to get motivated to realize there, there's a better way, you need that significant emotional event, unfortunately... Often you'll see this. Um, that significant emotional event will most likely be a scar on your life. Because something drove you to a place you needed to be. It might have been an injury. It might have been a death. It might have been a disease. It might Something. It, I don't know what. Maybe you were about to OD on drugs. Maybe... You were getting close to cirrhosis of the liver. Whatever the problem was, something, someone, something told you this is not going to end very well. Well, on my day, when I was 19, I heard a preacher tell me this is not going to end very well for you. The opportunity you have today, here today and online, 
you can you can try this this other way that will change your life in ways that nothing you've ever done will accomplish it, can I get an amen for that? For those of you that know Jesus in a life-giving measure, you should stand up behind me, not physically. I, someone said that when he was preaching one time. I was half asleep because I lost attention. I stood up. Don't stand up now. I didn't mean that. It's just embarrassing. They, what do you need, Brother Franklin? Nothing. <laughs> so I, 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 I need you to grasp the moment right now. Everyone under the sound of my voice, you are struggling with something today. Now, you're smiling because a lot of us that know Jesus in this life-giving measure, that's what the peace of God is about, right? That's what the joy of the Lord is. That's, what the, that's, that's what's so exciting about going through the most painful time in my life and still be able to leap for joy and raise my hands and run the aisles and shout, thank you, Jesus, when the world will say, what are you doing? Your child is dying in the hospital. I am praising God. Because in my life, when those emotional events came and when those scars came, the only hope I had was to try another way. And that other way is giving Jesus Christ every ounce of your life, pouring yourself into him, coming to an altar of repentance and saying, God, I'm sorry for trying all these other ways, but I'm going to give you a shot because there is another way. When Jesus says, wilt thou be made whole, don't say it's their fault. I made a mistake. I'm wrong. I want to try your way, Jesus. I don't want to try and get in the pool. There's another way. Stand up, leap to your feet, and begin to praise God. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19. If in this life only, that's what the preacher told me. If, if in this life only you have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. What gives me hope and joy and peace and, and excitement in serving God today is that this life is just a vapor. There's a small space of time between the dashes. And I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that one of these days when I have my last breath or my heart pumps the last time, it might happen today or in 20 years. But I'm telling you, when I begin to see my feet separate between the earth and the heavens and I go up to see my Savior that give me joy and peace and love in this other way, I'll be glad that I just didn't have hope down here. Isaiah 55 and 6, Seek ye the Lord. Well, he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. If you leave today and you have not sought the Lord from the innermost part of your being, if you've not called upon the Lord before you leave today, this is your chance. You may not have another chance. This is a wicked world out there. It's a crazy place we live in. Besides that, most of us haven't changed our diets yet. <laughs> so, you know, my heart, I don't know how good it is, but I'm trying to change. But we, we don't have another chance after right now. We, we, we have an opportunity this moment to say, God, I'm going to open myself up and give my heart to you. I'm going to give myself to you. Even those of you that, that know Jesus uh, in a life-giving manner, you know that you're struggling with something. And I just want to reach out to at least one person this morning to tell you there is another way. You don't have to struggle anymore. You don't have to worry anymore. It's still going to happen, but you can have this other way and be made whole in a way that only Jesus Christ can do and not this world. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things, and I believe that. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Now, I'm not good at much. I'm not pandering to myself. I'm not good at much. I'm like that baseball player that's a utility guy. They need a utility guy that can do a little of everything. He's not good at nothing, but he can bail us out in trouble. Now, I always felt like I could do anything in life. I always just felt that way. I had this positive attitude. I can do anything. I, I'll, I'll try it at least once. 
I'm not fearful to try something. First time they asked me to climb a power pole with 70,000 volts on it. I didn't even think twice. I said, how you do that? They got me sharp things. You strap on your feet, this belt, you wrap around a pole, and I start climbing. I got about five feet and slipped and fell. Now, that scared me a little bit, but I just I cleaned a couple splinters out of me, and I got back on that pole, and I climbed again. And he said, don't go any closer than 10 feet. I just, I mean, I just, one time, I was telling, I think it's Brother Jim, I was maybe telling, but a choir director one time didn't have a drummer. Didn't have any, anybody drum. I've never touched a set of drums in my entire life. And we need to do choir practice. And he said, does anybody, at the time, we had about maybe 40 people choir. Anybody, anybody know how to play drums? I said, he looked at me, Brother Frank, I said, yeah. All right. So I went over and got on them. I looked for the sticks. I finally found them there in the side of that big one with, with the glen. I found those. And I looked at things. I saw what drummers did. They tightened things and moved things around. So I started tightening things and pushing things around, banging things. I have no idea what I'm doing. And he started, I think it was Goodbye World Goodbye, I'm pretty sure. And so they started playing it, and I started hitting him things. And he went about so many stanzas into it, and he shut her down. He said, okay, I think we got started on the wrong key. Uh, I look back now, he's being polite. He's wondering, what happened to him, the drummer? And so we took off and started it again. And uh, after a second time through, he asked me if I, I had everything I needed to accomplish my goals. I said, yeah, I got it. I said, start off wrong. I said, wrong beat. <laughs> so I got back and he said, all right, let's, let's do this again. So we took off again. He got done. He went about four or five, six standards into it. He, okay, he said, uh, you know what we're going to do? I just, he felt so sorry for me. He said, I think we just, you know, why don't we just pray tonight? I thought, God got a hold of him because I don't know what I'm doing. That's good. Let's shut this down and pray. He told me later, you have never played drums in your life, have you? I said, nope. And I've never played them again, Brother Smith. <laughs> but I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I believe I can attack every devil and every imp in hell because he strengthens me. That did not used to be the way, but because that day I chose to try this other way, I now can do all things through Christ because he strengthens me. He gives me what I need to get through these difficult times Amen. that you're going through too. I want you to know this morning, you're not alone. Hey, people, if you've got Jesus, if you've got, if, if you made that change one day and said enough's enough and you went towards God and you went to an altar and you, you repented and you got baptized in the only name over here in Jesus' name, but then you were filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you know what I'm talking about because you have been through those hard times and you go into Philippians 4.13 on those days and you say, oh, hold on, devil, I can do all things through Christ because he strengthens me. The impotent man, the only way I can get any help, I've got to compete with all these people. I can't do this by myself. Change. Change. You need to get motivated to change. We talk around here all the time about change, rearranging our priorities and our service to God or or our servitude to the church building or property itself or the process that we serve in order to do that, you're going to have to get motivated to make that change. The devil doesn't want you to get excited about where this church is going. He doesn't want you to get thrilled about the direction of the leadership around here. He doesn't want you to get excited in just a few moments when we're having the next service and the choir singing. He doesn't want you to get excited about the fact that you have an opportunity to go hear him say well done because that'll get you motivated. He doesn't want he doesn't want you to see this person get a healing over here because that will motivate you. He doesn't want you to see you get that new job that you weren't trying to get for a long time and all of a sudden they came in and gave it to you because that will motivate you. He's doing everything he can to make sure you don't get excited and you don't get motivated. But here's the thing. You have control of yourself. One of these days, you got to get up off your stool and do nothing in the middle of that heartache, in the middle of that trial, and leap for heart and say, Jesus is everything to me. If I'm running a race against all you, I can see the impotent man. If I'm running a race against all you, there's a good chance I'm not going to win. So I've got to try something new, another way. Philippians 4 and 7. 
And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Luke, I'm going to wrap up now. Luke 12 and 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Well, he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns. I'll build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Where's his motivation to change anything? He's got everything he needs. It's not the money that ruins you or the stuff that we have or the things that we can do. It's the love for it. It's just, I want a lot more money. <laughs> but if you've been around me long enough, money doesn't really... It gets in the way, folks. I'm, not, I'm just going to be, can I just be real this morning? <laughs> I know money is necessary. I know money is important. I know we need it. And you've got to feed your family. You've got to pay your bills. But you know what? Don't fall in love with it. Stuff. Don't. Don't. Here's the rich man. He's so set. He's got everything he ever needed. And he's sitting in his, in his home, his palatial estate, wondering, how am I going to fix all these other things? What else can I do to get a new wagon, a new chariot, a new barn? See, he's occupied. His brain is occupied. There's, there's too much going on. Why would he want another way when everything seems to be going good? But you ever heard the story, look on the other side of the billboard? It sure is an empty feeling, folks. That's why you see a lot, of, a lot of people like this rich man struggle to be happy. I'll tell you what makes me happy. Not the, not the retirement plan I have. I'm taken care of. That, that does not make me happy. Never did. Never would. What makes me happy? And you just call it what you want. It's when I walk into the house of God. And I see a child of God that I know was going through nothing but pain and agony. And they're up at the altar just giving everything they've got. And people that would know their problem would say, how do they smile through that? Well, it's the other way. Don't think your way. It's the other way. And... The rich man was asked, huh, what are you going to do about your soul? Have you thought about that? We can get so busy and so wrapped up in this world. And then we begin to wonder, man, why is it like this? Come on into the house of God. Step into the presence of a living God. Stand in to the place, metaphorically speaking, some can't stand. Just and lift your hands. Let's, let's stand this morning right now. Let's do that. And, and, and come into a place to where you know that God has given you an opportunity to make a change. The last one I'll read and we'll wrap up. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore take no thought saying, What shall I eat? What shall I drink? Oh, wherewithal shall we be clothed? See the worry? Oh, what am I going to do? This, I'm going through so much. Oh no, what am I going to do for... Oh, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Church, I know it's hard to change. I want to motivate you this morning. That if you don't change now, you will change later. <laughs> it is time to change our thought process to try the other way. When you seek God for your answer, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. It's the only option you have. And leaning upon God is the best thing I've learned 
to ever do in my life during my heartache and my struggles. And when I come out of the fire, literally, I look back and say, Whoo, how'd you do that, God? <laughs> I'm probably not the only one that wondered, how did he ever accomplish that? Now that we're through it today, and tomorrow's another day. I want you, as, as we dismiss, I want you to just internally take some time and think about what you're going through and maybe what your family's going through. Or if you don't know Jesus today, again, in that life-giving measure, um, this is your day. Don't waste your opportunity to know who Jesus is. And, and in the next few minutes, we're going to take a break. We're going to have a chance to come down here and pray and prepare ourselves for what God has in store for us in the next few minutes. And I can tell you, there's a storehouse of things coming your way. Where will you be to be ready to receive it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your wonderful blessing, for the opportunity to be in this place, to feel your presence, to hear your word, and to know that the option I have is to lean unto you and to give you my heart and my life and try this way, for there's not a better way. There's not a, a, a more unique opportunity on this earth we live in and in this life than coming into this place, coming to an altar of repentance, being baptized in your name, receiving your presence and your spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. All that God encompassed about this other way. And we thank you for this opportunity. We ask you to bless the next few hours. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise God.